The Odyssey of Homer. K-18. The fighting at fists of Odysseus with Iris. His admonitions to Amphinomus. Penelope appears before the wars, and draws presents from them. Then up came a common beggar, who was wont to beg through the town of Ithaca, one that was known among all men for ravening greed, for his endless eating and drinking, yet he had no force or might, though he was bulky enough to look on. Aeneas was his name, for so had his good mother given it him at his birth, but all the young men called him Iris, because he ran on errands, whensoever any might bid him. So now he came, and would have driven Odysseus from his own house, and began reviling him, and spake winged words. Get thee hence, old man, from the doorway, lest thou be even hailed out soon by the foot. Sayest thou not that all are now giving me the wink, and bidding me drag thee forth? Nevertheless, I feel shame of the task. Nay get thee up, lest our quarrel soon pass even to blows. Then Odysseus of many counsels looked fiercely on him, and spake saying, Sir, neither in deed nor word do I harm thee, nor do I grudge that any should give to thee, yea though it were a good handful. But this threshold will hold us both, and thou hast no need to be jealous for the sake of other men's goods. Thou seemest to me to be a wanderer, even as I am, and the gods it is that are like to give us gain. Only provoke me not overmuch to buffeting, lest thou anger me, and old though I be I defile thy breast and lips with blood. Thereby should I have the greater quiet tomorrow, for methinks that thou shalt never again come to the hall of Odysseus, son of Laertes. Then the beggar Iris spake unto him in anger, Lo now, how trippingly and like an old cinder wife this glutton speaks, on whom I will work my evil will, and smite him right and left, and drive all the teeth from his jaws to the ground, like the tusks of a swine that spoils the corn. Gird thyself now, that even these men all may know our mettle in fight. Nay, how shouldst thou do battle with a younger man than thou? Thus did they wet each the other's rage right manfully before the lofty doors upon the polished threshold. And the mighty prince Antinous heard the twain, and sweetly he laughed out, and spake among the wars. Friends, never before has there been such a thing, such goodly game has a god brought to this house. The stranger yonder and Iris are bidding each other to buffets. Quick, let us match them one against the other. Then all at the word leaped up laughing, and gathered round the ragged beggars, and Antinous, son of Eupetes, spake among them saying, Hear me, ye lordly wars, and I will say somewhat. Here are goats' bellies lying at the fire, that we laid by at supper time, and filled with fat and blood. Now whichsoever of the twain wins, and shows himself the better man, let him stand up and take his choice of these puddings. And further, he shall always eat at our feasts, nor will we suffer any other beggar to come among us and ask for arms. So spake Antinous, and the saying pleased them well. Then Odysseus of many counsels spake among them craftily. Friends, an old man and foredone with travail may in no wise fight with a younger. But my belly's call is urgent on me, that evil worker, to the end that I may be subdued with stripes. But come now, swear me all of you a strong oath, so that none, for the sake of showing a favor to Iris, may strike me a foul blow with heavy hand and subdue me by violence to my foe. So he spake, and they all swore not to strike him, as he bade them. Now when they had sworn and done that oath, the mighty prince Telemachus once more spake among them. Stranger, if thy heart and lordly spirit urge thee to rid thee of this fellow, then fear not any other of the Achaeans, for whoso strikes thee shall have to fight with many. Thy host am I, and the princes consent with me, Antinous and Eurymachus, men of wisdom both. So spake he, and they all consented thereto. Then Odysseus girt his rags about his loins, and let his thighs be seen, goodly and great, and his broad shoulders and breast and mighty arms were manifest. And Athene came nigh and made greater the limbs of the shepherd of the people. Then the wars were exceedingly amazed, and thus would one speak looking to his neighbor. Right soon will Iris, you and I roost, have a bane of his own bringing, such a thigh as that old man shows from out his rags. So they spake, and the mind of Iris was pitifully stirred, but even so the servants girded him and led him out before in great fear, his flesh trembling on his limbs. Then Antinous chid him, and spake and hailed him. Thou lubber, better for thee that thou wert not now, nor ever hadst been born, if indeed thou tremblest before this man, and art so terribly afraid, an old man too he is, and foredone with the travail that is come upon him. But I will tell thee plainly, and it shall surely be accomplished. 
If this man prevail against thee and prove thy master, I will cast thee into a black ship, and send thee to the mainland to Ecatus the king, the maimer of all mankind, who will cut off thy nose and ears with the pitiless steel, and draw out thy vitals and give them raw to dogs to rend. So he spake, and yet greater trembling got hold of the limbs of Iris, and they led him into the ring, and the twain put up their hands. Then the steadfast goodly Odysseus mused in himself whether he should smite him in such wise that his life should leave his body, even there where he fell, or whether he should strike him lightly, and stretch him on the earth. And as he thought thereon, this seemed to him the better way, to strike lightly, that the Achaeans might not take note of him, who he was. Then the twain put up their hands, and Iris struck at the right shoulder, but the other smote him on his neck beneath the ear, and crushed in the bones, and straightway the red blood gushed up through his mouth, and with a moan he fell in the dust, and drave together his teeth as he kicked the ground. But the proud wars threw up their hands, and died outright for laughter. Then Odysseus seized him by the foot, and dragged him forth through the doorway, till he came to the courtyard and the gates of the gallery, and he set him down and rested him against the courtyard wall, and put his staff in his hands, and uttering his voice spake to him winged words. Sit thou there now, and scare off swine and dogs, and let not such an one as thou be lord over strangers and beggars, pitiful as thou art, lest haply some worse thing befall thee. Thus he spake, and cast about his shoulders his mean scrip all tattered, and the cord therewith to hang it, and he gat him back to the threshold, and sat him down there again. Now the wars went within laughing sweetly, and greeted him, saying, May Zeus, stranger, and all the other deathless gods give thee thy dearest wish, even all thy heart's desire, seeing that thou hast made that insatiate one to cease from his begging in the land. Soon will we take him over to the mainland, to Ecatus the king, the maimer of all mankind. So they spake, and goodly Odysseus rejoiced in the omen of the words. And Antinous set by him the great pudding, stuffed with fat and blood, and Amphinomus took up two loaves from the basket, and set them by him and pledged him in a golden cup, and spake saying, Father and stranger, hail! May happiness be thine in the time to come, but as now, thou art fast holden in many sorrows. And Odysseus of many counsels answered him saying, Amphinomus, verily thou seemest to me a prudent man enough, for such too was the father of whom thou art sprung, for I have heard the fair fame of him, how that Nisus of Dulichium was a good man and a rich, and his son they say thou art, and thou seemest a man of understanding. Wherefore I will tell thee, and do thou mark and listen to me. Nought feebler doth the earth nurture than man, of all the creatures that breathe and move upon the face of the earth. Lo, he thinks that he shall never suffer evil in time to come, while the gods give him happiness, and his limbs move lightly. But when again the blessed gods have wrought for him sorrow, even so he bears it, as he must, with a steadfast heart. For the spirit of men upon the earth is even as their day, that comes upon them from the father of gods and men. Yea, and I too once was like to have been prosperous among men, but many an infatuate deed I did, giving place to mine own hardihood and strength, and trusting to my father and my brethren. Wherefore let no man forever be lawless any more, but keep quietly the gifts of the gods, whatsoever they may give. Such infatuate deeds do I see the wars devising, as they waste the wealth, and hold in no regard the wife of a man, who, methinks, will not much longer be far from his friends and his own land, nay he is very near. But for thee, may some god withdraw thee hence to thy home, and mayst thou not meet him in the day when he returns to his own dear country. For not without blood, as I deem, will they be sundered, the wars and Odysseus, when once he shall have come beneath his own roof. Thus he spake, and poured an offering, and then drank of the honey-sweet wine, and again set the cup in the hands of the array of the people. But the other went back through the hall, sad at heart and bowing his head, for verily his soul boded evil. Yet even so he avoided not his fate, for Athene had bound him likewise to be slain outright at the hands and by the spear of Telemachus. So he sat down again on the high seat whence he had arisen. Now the goddess, grey-eyed Athene, put it into the heart of the daughter of Icarius, wise Penelope, to show herself to the wooers, that she might make their heart all flutter with hope, and that she might win yet more worship from her lord and her son than heretofore. To she laughed an idle laugh, and spake to the nurse, and hailed her, saying, Eurynome, my heart yearns, though before I had no such desire, to show myself to the wars, hateful as they are. I would also say a word to my son, that will be for his weal, namely, that he should not forever consort with the proud wars, who speak friendly with their lips, but imagine evil in the latter end. 
Then the housewife, Urinone, spake to her saying, Yea my child, all this thou hast spoken as is meet. Go then, and declare thy word to thy son, and hide it not, but first wash thee and anoint thy face, and go not as thou art with thy cheeks all stained with tears. Go, for it is little good to sorrow always, and never cease. And lo, thy son is now of an age to hear thee, he whom thou hast above all things prayed the gods that thou mightest see with a beard upon his chin. Then wise Penelope answered her, saying, Urinone, speak not thus comfortably to me, for all thy love, bidding me to wash and be anointed with ointment. For the gods that keep Olympus destroyed my blue, since the day that he departed in the hollow ships. But bid Autonu and Hippodamea come to me, to stand by my side in the halls. Alone I will not go among men, for I am ashamed. So she spake, and the old woman passed through the chamber to tell the maidens, and hasten their coming. Thereon the goddess, grey-eyed Athene, had another thought. She shed a sweet slumber over the daughter of Icarius, who sank back in sleep, and all her joints were loosened as she lay in the chair, and the fair goddess that while was giving her gifts immortal, that all the Achaeans might marvel at her. Her fair face first she steeped with beauty imperishable, such as that wherewith the crowned Cytheria is anointed, when she goes to the lovely dances of the graces. And she made her taller and greater to behold, and made her whiter than new-sawn ivory. Now when she had wrought thus, that fair goddess departed, and the white-armed handmaidens came forth from the chamber and drew nigh with a sound of voices. Then sweet sleep left hold of Penelope, and she rubbed her cheeks with her hands, and said, Surely soft slumber wrapped me round, most wretched though I be. Oh! That pure Artemis would give me so soft a death even now, that I might no more waste my life in sorrow of heart, and longing for the manifold excellence of my dear lord, for that he was foremost of the Achaeans. With this word she went down from the shining upper chamber, not alone, for two handmaidens likewise bear her company. But when the fair lady had now come to the wars, she stood by the pillar of the well-builded roof, holding her glistening tire before her face, and on either side of her stood a faithful handmaid. And straightway the knees of the wars were loosened, and their hearts were enchanted with love, and each one uttered a prayer that he might be her bedfellow. But she spake to Telemachus, her dear son. Telemachus, thy mind and thy thoughts are no longer stable as they were. While thou wast still a child, thou hadst a yet quicker and more crafty wit, but now that thou art great of growth, and art come to the measure of manhood, and a stranger looking to thy stature and thy beauty might say that thou must be some rich man's son, thy mind and thy thoughts are no longer right as of old. For lo, what manner of deed has been done in these halls, in that thou hast suffered thy guest to be thus shamefully dealt with? How would it be now, if the stranger sitting thus in our house, were to come to some harm all through this evil handling? Shame and disgrace would be thine henceforth among men. Then wise Telemachus answered her, Mother mine, as to this matter I count it no blame that thou art angered. Yet have I knowledge and understanding of each thing, of the good and of the evil, but heretofore I was a child. Howbeit I cannot devise all things according to wisdom, for these men in their evil counsel drive me from my wits, on this side and on that, and there is none to aid me. Howsoever this battle between Iris and the stranger did not fall out as the wars would have had it, but the stranger proved the better man. Would to Father Zeus and Athene and Apollo, that the wars in our halls were even now thus vanquished, and wagging their heads, some in the court, and some within the house, and that the limbs of each man were loosened in such fashion as Iris yonder sits now, by the courtyard gates wagging his head, like a drunken man, and cannot stand upright on his feet, nor yet get him home to his own place, seeing that his limbs are loosened. Thus they spake one to another. But Eurymachus spake to Penelope, saying, Daughter of Icarius, wise Penelope, if all the Achaeans in Iasian Argos could behold thee, even a greater press of wolves would feast in your halls from tomorrow's dawn, since thou dost surpass all women in beauty and stature, and within in wisdom of mind. Then wise Penelope answered him, Eurymachus, surely my excellence, both of face and form, the gods destroyed in the day when the Argives embarked for Ilios, and with them went my lord Odysseus. If but he might come and watch over this my life, greater thus would be my fame and fairer. But now am I in sorrow, such a host of ills some god has sent against me. Ah, well do I remember, when he set forth and left his own country, how he took me by the right hand at the wrist and spake, saying, Lady, methinks that all the goodly grieved Achaeans will not win a safe return from Troy, for the Trojans too, they say, are good men at arms, as spearsmen, 
and bowmen, and drivers of fleet horses, such as ever most swiftly determine the great strife of equal battle. Wherefore I know not if the gods will suffer me to return, or whether I shall be cut off there in Troy, so do thou have a care for all these things. Be mindful of my father and my mother in the halls, even as now thou art, yet more than now, while I am far away. But when thou seest thy son a bearded man, marry whom thou wilt and leave thine own house. Even so did he speak, and now all these things have an end. The night shall come when a hateful marriage shall find me out, me most luckless, whose good hap Zeus has taken away. But furthermore this sore trouble has come on my heart and soul, for this was not the manner of wars in time past. Whoso wished to woo a good lady and the daughter of a rich man, and vie one with another, themselves bring with them oxen of their own and goodly flocks, a banquet for the friends of the bride, and they give the lady splendid gifts, but do not devour another's livelihood without atonement. Thus she spake, and the steadfast goodly Odysseus rejoiced because she drew from them gifts, and beguiled their souls with soothing words, while her heart was set on other things. Then Antinous, son of Eupethes, answered her again, daughter of Icarius, wise Penelope, the gifts which any of the Achaeans may choose to bring hither, do thou take, for it were ill to withhold a gift. But we for our part will neither go to our lands nor otherwhere, before thou art wedded to the best man of the Achaeans. So spake Antinous, and the saying pleased them well, and each man sent a henchman to bring his gifts. For Antinous his henchman bare a broidered robe, great and very fair, wherein were golden brooches, twelve in all, fitted with well-bent clasps. And the henchman straightway bare Eurymachus a golden chain of curious work, strung with amber beads, shining like the sun. And his squires bare for Eurydamas a pair of earrings, with three drops well wrought, and much grace shone from them. And out of the house of Paysander the prince, the son of Polycta, the squire brought a necklet, a very lovely jewel. And likewise the Achaeans brought each one some other beautiful gift. Then the fair lady went aloft to her upper chamber, and her attendant maidens bare for her the lovely gifts, while the wolves turned to dancing and the delight of song, and therein took their pleasure, and awaited the coming of eventide. And dark evening came on them at their pastime. Anon they set up three braziers in the halls, to give them light, and on these they laid firewood all around, faggots seasoned long since and sear, and new split with the axe. And midway by the braziers they placed torches, and the maids of Odysseus, of the hardy heart, held up the lights in turn. Then the prince Odysseus of many counsels himself spake among them saying, Ye maidens of Odysseus, the lord so long afar, get ye into the chambers where the honoured queen abides, and twist the yarn at her side, and gladden her heart as ye sit in the chamber, or card the walls with your hands, but I will minister light to all these that are here. For even if they are minded to wait the throne dawn, they shall not outstay me, so long enduring am I. So he spake, but they laughed and looked one at the other. And the fair Melantho chid him shamefully, Melantho that Dolius begat, but Penelope reared, and entreated her tenderly as she had been her own child, and gave her playthings to her heart's desire. Yet, for all that, sorrow for Penelope touched not her heart, but she loved Eurymachus and was his paramour. Now she chid Odysseus with railing words. Wretched guest, surely thou art some brain-struck man, seeing that thou dost not choose to go and sleep at a smithy, or at some place of common resort, but here thou pratest much and boldly among many lords and hast no fear at heart. Verily wine has got about thy wits, or perchance thou art always of this mind, and so thou dost babble idly. Art thou beside thyself for joy, because thou hast beaten the beggar Iris? Take heed lest a better man than Iris rise up presently against thee, to lay his mighty hands about thy head and bedabble thee with blood, and send thee hence from the house. Then Odysseus of many counsels looked fiercely on her, and said, Yeah, straight will I go yonder and tell Telemachus hereof, thou shameless thing, for this thy speech, that forthwith he may cut thee limb from limb. So he spake, and with his saying scared away the women, who fled through the hall, and the knees of each were loosened for fear, for they deemed that his words were true. But Odysseus took his stand by the burning braziers, tending the lights, and gazed on all the men, but far other matters he pondered in his heart, things not to be unfulfilled. Now Athene would in no wise suffer the lordly wars to abstain from biting scorn, that the pain might sink yet the deeper into the heart of Odysseus, son of Laertes. So Eurymachus, son of Polybus, began to speak among them, girding at Odysseus, and so made mirth for his friends. Hear me ye wars of the queen renowned, that I may say that which my spirit within me bids me. 
Not without the gods will has this man come to the house of Odysseus, methinks at least that the torchlight flares forth from that head of his, for there are no hairs on it, nay never so thin. He spake and withal addressed Odysseus, waster of cities, stranger, wouldest thou indeed be my hireling, if I would take thee for my man, at an upland farm, and thy wages shall be assured thee, and there shalt thou gather stones for walls and plant tall trees. There would I provide thee bread continual, and clothe thee with raiment, and give thee shoes for thy feet. Howbeit, since thou art practised only in evil, thou wilt not care to go to the labours of the field, but wilt choose rather to go louting through the land, that thou mayst have wherewithal to feed thine insatiate belly. Then Odysseus of many counsels answered him, and said, Eurymachus, would that there might be a trial of labour between us twain, in the season of spring, when the long days begin. In the deep grass might it be, and I should have a crooked scythe, and thou another like it, that we might try each the other in the matter of labour, fasting till late eventide, and grass there should be in plenty. Or would again, that there were oxen to drive, the best there may be, large and tawny, both well filled with fodder, of equal age and forced to bear the yoke and of strength untiring. And it should be a field of four ploughgates, and the clod should yield before the ploughshare. Then shouldest thou see me, whether or no I would cut a clean furrow unbroken before me. Or would that this very day Cronian might waken war whence he would, and that I had a shield and two spears, and a helmet all of bronze, close fitting on my temples. Then shouldest thou see me mingling in the forefront of the battle, nor speak and taunt me with this my belly. Nay, thou art exceeding wanton, and thy heart is hard, and thou thinkest thyself some great one and mighty, because thou consortest with few men and feeble. Ah, if Odysseus might but return and come to his own country, right soon would yonder doors full wide as they are, prove all too straight for thee in thy flight through the doorway. Thus he spake, and Eurymachus waxed yet the more wroth at heart, and looking fiercely on him spake to him winged words. Ah, wretch that thou art, right soon will I work thee mischief, so boldly thou pratest among many lords, and hast no fear at heart. Verily wine has got about thy wits, or perchance thou art always of this mind, and so thou dost babble idly. Art thou beside thyself for joy, because thou hast beaten the beggar Iris? Therewith he caught up a footstool, but Odysseus sat him down at the knees of Amphinomus of Dulichium, in dread of Eurymachus. And Eurymachus cast and smote the cupbearer on the right hand, and the ladle cup dropped to the ground with a clang, while the young man groaned and fell backwards in the dust. Then the wars clamoured through the shadowy halls, and thus one would say looking to his neighbour, Would that our wandering guest had perished otherwhere, or ever he came hither, so should he never have made all this tumult in our midst. But now we are all at strife about beggars, and there will be no more joy of the good feast, for worse things have their way. Then the mighty prince Telemachus spake among them. Sirs, ye are mad, now doth your mood betray that ye have eaten and drunken, some one of the gods is surely moving you. Nay, now that ye have feasted well, go home and lay you to rest, since your spirit so bids, for as for me, I drive no man hence. Thus he spake, and they all bit their lips and marvelled at Telemachus, in that he spake boldly. Then Amphinomus made harangue, and spake among them, Amphinomus, the famous son of Nisus the prince, the son of Aretius. Friends, when a righteous word has been spoken, none surely would rebuke another with hard speech and be angry. Misuse ye not this stranger, neither any of the thralls that are in the house of God like Odysseus. But come, let the wine-bearer pour for libation into each cup in turn, that after the drink-offering we may get us home to bed. But the stranger let us leave in the halls of Odysseus for a charge to Telemachus, for to his home has he come. Thus he spake, and his word was well-pleasing to them all. Then the Lord Nullius mixed for them the bowl, the henchman out of Dulichium, who was squire of Amphinomus. And he stood by all and served it to them in their turn, and they poured forth before the blessed gods, and drank the honey-sweet wine. Now when they had poured forth and had drunken to their heart's content, they departed to lie down, each one to his own house. Thank you for watching. If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content.